What's up guys, thanks for tuning in to the Sailing SV EOS channel. This is part two of our what it's like to buy your first sailboat videos. If you haven't seen part one yet, make sure you check out the description for the link. What was the first thing you did with your boat? So I bought the boat at a yacht club, which was like down in southern New Jersey. And um, I couldn't keep it there because it was a yacht club. I wasn't part of the yacht club. So I motored out of the, I don't want to say it was a bay because it was like, there's like a river that ran down into a large body of water and it was down there. So in order to get out, I had to go up the bay under two bridges and then out to the open ocean basically and then I found a marina there <clears throat> and I kept the boat on a mooring for like a month because I couldn't go to the marina that was up by Jersey City that I was trying to go to for another month because that's when their season started and they charged like three dollars per foot per day so it would have been almost a hundred dollars per day so yes. for a month it would have been insane so instead I kept it at this other marina and I just it was daily, but it was like nothing because it was a mooring. And you were living on the boat then? I was, yeah. I lived on it on a mooring and I had nothing. No electricity? Nope. The boat had four batteries in it, I think, but one was a starter, so there were three batteries. So there was a lot of capacity, but the only way that I had to generate energy was a small, portable, 30-watt solar panel. I was extremely conservative with the energy I used because I knew if I drained the batteries too much that they would get ruined. And I had no way of accurately measuring how much power was in them. All the electricity I used was like charging my smartphone. I, I bought a little handheld spotlight that I charged by USB and I used that at night when it was too dark. And I had no running water because none of the plumbing was hooked up. So all the water I had was just in jugs and I had no dinghy. Mm -hmm. So the only way I could get back and forth to land was by using the launch service that the marina provided. But they only ran from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. You get the boat and you had to motor it. Did everything go all right? It went okay, because I really hadn't had much experience with boats. We weren't going to try to do any sailing. The only real major thing that happened during that was that there is a bridge. It's called the Seabright Bridge. And I think the bridge is like 30 feet high or something. And my mast is like 40 something. Yeah. So I couldn't make it under this bridge. So I called ahead of time and <clears throat> I was having such a hard time talking with the operators of the bridge. I couldn't figure out why. I was like, so this was the first time I was using the boat using the radio and it was super staticky. I was just like, crap, the radio must be like old. It's worked that well. And it was so I was having such a hard time communicating with them. And then we got to the bridge and they were able to understand what I was asking them to do. But the radio is under, it's not in the cockpit of the boat. And I was the only one on the boat that was like comfortable handling it. So Alec just ended up steering the boat while it was basically just like dead in the water. Yeah. With the motor was on, but it was in neutral. And so by the time I finished telling them what I needed to tell them, and come back up, we were like drifting sideways in the middle of a channel and there was a current. So we were moving towards the bridge. Right, right. <laughs> so they were like calling me on the radio. They were like, hey, what's going on over there? You gotta wait like 10 minutes before we can open the bridge. And I was like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's fine. We'll figure it out. So I just ended up like motoring like I don't know if you've ever seen Austin Powers, but there's a scene where he like gets a golf cart stuck in this like really narrow alleyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. like just motoring like back and forth, trying not to like get too close to the houses <laughs> or the docks and trying to keep away from the bridge. So I ended up turning the boat around 180 away from the bridge and then we just motored and made a nice big turn and, right. and just I went really slow around the turn until the bridge was open and then we just gunned it through the bridge. <laughs> and it wasn't until later when we made it to the marina that I had time to look up the manual for the radio. I hadn't adjusted the game. Mm. The radio was perfectly fine. There was just a game knob that was like turned all the way up. So it was making it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I, I was able to, once I looked up the manual, I actually had time. I fixed it in like, you know, five seconds. I was just right. like, oh, yep, there we go. It's Trade now. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. It was funny. It, it all went well. No, nothing got damaged. We never were really close to disaster. Like, it sounds like, yeah, we were drifting towards the bridge, but I mean, we were like, you know, hundreds of feet away from the bridge mm -hmm. and we were moving it like a knot. 
yeah. to Prince the Fridge, so it was it was fine. <laughs> what was it like to live on the boat right when you got it? Because you were on the mooring, on the mooring. and then you were, went to the marina and you lived there too? Yes, I did live on the boat at the marina later. So on the mooring, it was actually great. Like I said, I didn't have access to running water or electricity, but uh, it didn't really bother that, me that much. It was just like really cool to be on a boat. So it was it was good. I liked it. I liked having like a space that was my own, like I owned it and I could theoretically go anywhere with it once I had the right skill set. Yeah. And actually one time while I was down there, I did take the boat out. I piloted the boat and uh, my brother went to the front of the boat with a mooring hook so he could grab the mooring lines. I was feeling pretty confident about it. I was getting a pretty good handle on the boat. So there were like a lot of boats there. You had to be relatively good at handling the boat in order to not hit anything else. But I was feeling pretty confident about it. So I took the boat out, started the motor, unhooked the mooring lines. I don't, I didn't have a chart plotter. I didn't have a GPS other than like my phone. And I hadn't taken the time to get like any charts. So I just went across the bay. There was like a beach over there where there were a bunch of other like sailboats and power boats anchored up. And I went by them. And then there was like this horrible, it wasn't grinding, but it was just like a smushing sound. And then the boat wasn't moving anymore. And I was like... Hmm, interesting. So I like put the motor in reverse, nothing happened. There was enough current that I wasn't sure I wasn't moving. Do you know what I mean? Right. So I like put it in reverse and I'm like looking, like looking out at the land and like picked a spot and I was like, I'm not moving. So I put it back and forwards and I'm looking at the spot and I'm like, I'm definitely not moving. And then one of the things that I remembered from the boating safety course that I read is that if you get beached and you install it. So as soon as I realized what had happened, I shut the motor off. So I called the Coast Guard, which by the way, if you've never had to call the Coast Guard, they're actually like really helpful. They like responded pretty quickly. I had no GPS coordinates, no charts, nothing. I literally just told them where I had left from and what direction I went. And they were able to get to where I was in like less than 20 minutes. They just came right on over. They took a little report from me about what happened. And then they were like, so what do you want to do? I was like, what do you mean? Well, like, what are my options? And they were like, well, you can call a tow service because we're not allowed to pull you off for liability reasons. So you can call a tow service, but it'll probably be like a thousand dollars minimum. And I was just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like they're gonna charge me a thousand dollars to literally pull my boat off the sandbar. Uh, and then they were like, or you can just wait because it's low tide right now. You can wait till high tide. And I said, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. This is the great thing about the Coast Guard. They actually did check-ins with me every half hour uh, to see my situation. Every half hour I would radio to them and I'd just <laughs> give them an update on what was happening. So I'd call them and be like, yep, you know, it's 2.30 now. I'm still stuck on the sandbar. The tide's coming in, everything's fine. The boat is undamaged, so I'm in no harm. They'd be like, okay, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Magic Girl 3. <laughs> <laughs> and this happened, I think I was there for like two and a half hours. What I had to do was, because I was on a sandbar and the tide was coming, in the current was pushing me towards the beach so the coast guard guys were like drop your anchor so that you don't swing like further into the sandbar and get stuck again and i was like oh that's a good idea so i dropped my anchor the anchor hit the bottom from the bottom of the anchor to the point where it connects to the chain is about this far i would say it hit the bottom and the top of the anchor was sticking out of the water <laughs> <laughs> no joke. It was out of the water and then fell over into the water. So I went down the ladder on the back of the boat and was in knee deep water. And I walked to the front of the boat and picked up the anchor and I just walked out into the bay with the anchor until it was deep enough for me to like feel comfortable throwing it. Oh, I walked into like neck deep water and then just like threw the anchor as far away from my feet as I could as I like jumped because I didn't want to drop it on my own feet. So I like jumped and threw the anchor and <laughs> swam back to the boat. Whoa. And I got, I just just got on the boat and I waited for like two and a half hours for the tide to come in. So you must have hit the sandbar not at exactly low tide and the tide must have gone out further. I mean, I was moving at like six knots. <laughs> So I hit it. We really like, sank Whoa. into it. Yeah, fortunately it was all sand. There was no damage good, to the boat. Yeah, right. I didn't know that until later when I took it out of the water, but there was no damage to the boat. Again, advantage of full keel. I would have had a, a problem if I didn't yeah. have a, a full keel. One of the books that we read about boating, it's called Get Real, Get Gone. It's yes. this couple that wrote this book. And one of the things they say about buying a sailboat is that you're going to beat your boat. Yeah. So if you're buying a sailboat to do anything besides racing, make sure or you buy a boat with a keel that will survive beaching because yeah. racing boats tend to be built in a way that 
I'm saying. <laughs> if you beach it, the Why? keel will just get destroyed, or the rudder will get destroyed. So we'll add the, the link to that book. You don't necessarily have to have a full keel either. No. Maybe it'll be your second time ever motoring it, like Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or maybe it'll be somewhere, like, somewhere down the line. Right? So yeah, I, I just waited for two and a half hours, and right. it, it got, actually it was kind of scary, like right as the tide was coming in, because it got to the point where the boat was in enough water to start floating, but not enough water to go anywhere. So mm -hmm. every wave slammed the boat onto the sandbar. The boat was just like floating and then it would just go boom and like everything inside the boat would shake. And I was just like, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was gonna break. And I was like, oh boy. But eventually I swung around and that's, so, that's enough about the beaching story. It was fine, right. I motored out, we were good. Okay. My brother came down again at the end of the month and we motored it across the bay. This was like my first experience not on a ferry uh, or a small power boat going across like open water. So like big waves and stuff. And it was a lot of fun to go across the open bay. And we just motored for, I think it was like three hours. It took mm -hmm. us to get to the relanding. And then again, I'm not experienced. So once we got there, it was a crap show of trying to figure out. It took us 45 minutes to get the boat docked because I like went by the fuel dock. And I'm just like, cause I talked to them on the radio and they're like, yeah, yeah, we'll help you out when you get here. And I went by the fuel dock and I'm like, yelling at them like hey where do you want me to go and they're just like yeah you just go over there like in one of those slips and i was like i don't know how to do that and the guy was just like what Try to like fire. we're moving because i didn't want to stop moving because it was a current so yeah. i don't have bow thrusters if i stop moving and the boat turns i'm going in that direction so like we have this conversation he realizes i have no idea what i'm doing and now i'm gone <laughs> so i try <laughs> See you later. So I turn around and come back. What? So like I went down the channel a bit, turned around, came back in the other direction. And again, we have like the same interaction where he's like, okay, okay. Like you can't go over there. What about like, can you make this turn? And I'm looking and like, by the time we finish this conversation, I'm past the turn. So yeah. no, I go right on by. We now are out of speaking distance again. And I have to go out back into the bay, turn around, come back down the channel again for a third time. So we finally agree. I say, I'm going to turn around one more time at the end. And when I come back, just help me dock the boat at the fuel dock because it's it's right there. It was just rubber siding and then the fuel dock. So I turn around one more time and as I come up, he I just throw him the ropes and he pulls us in the fuel dock and like five minutes go by. And I'm like, ooh, finally, we've like did it. And he's like, yeah, I need you to move over there. And it was like down a narrow channel with expensive boats on both sides. I was in the uh, transient dock. So it's all like huge yachts and stuff, huge, huge power boats. I was just like, okay. <laughs> so I, I went out, went in, came around into the air, like the, where the actual slips were. So they did like double slips. So they'd be like two boats, dock, two boats, dock. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no other boat in it. Right. So I made the turn and I would highly recommend that if anybody is going to buy a sailboat, especially one without a bow thruster, that you learn how motoring a boat works. Because if I had not known how to motor a sailboat, I probably would have hit the docks. I don't want to get too much into it, but there's a thing called prop walk. And basically when you slam the boat into reverse, based on the direction the propeller spins, it, the back of the boat will start turning out. So rather than the front moving, the back will turn before like the rudder engages because you're not going fast enough. So I was able to use Use the limited ex experience I had had just by like watching YouTube videos to get it like jackknife into the dock and then pull the back end in so I could throw him the lines. So we got a dock there and that was where it stayed until I ended up eventually leaving that marina. Okay, so you lived on there for lived there. how long? I lived there for, I want to say it was almost two months. This whole story is leading towards this boat being the wrong decision. So Correct. what was your first red flag, assuming that it was during this living period or? It the was. The first red flag I think would be a red flag for many boaters, um, experienced or not, it was sinking. Yeah. Boat was sinking. My boat was sinking. It had probably been sinking since I bought it, realistically, which I know to like non-boaters, it's like, oh my God, how could you have bought a boat that was sinking? Wouldn't you know? But really it was leaking slowly enough that the bilge pump would turn on like once every four hours or so and it would run for like 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. So I just didn't even worry about it. I was like, that's probably fine. It's probably normal. Looking back, it was because it was leaking. Yeah. Which you know, I should have known, but yeah, so it was sinking and the bilge pumps died from just turning on once every four hours for like two months, three months now almost, and then just running for 15 seconds. That's really not good for them because mm -hmm. then they're running with very little amounts of water in them. So it died and I was thinking to myself, wow, this is great. Like the bilge pumps finally stopped running. I don't know if it was just because of rain or whatever, like, <laughs> but they stopped running. This is fantastic. And then, um, 
I had planned to go on a trip to London. I was like, okay, well, I better do like a check of the boat to make sure everything's okay before I go. This was like two weeks before I was supposed to leave. And I opened the hatch to the bilge and it was full of water to the level of the floor. Hey friend, how are you doing? <laughs> so there was just, do you know you're on camera now, Anton? I don't think he minds. For those of you listening to the podcast, there's a cat on Andrew's Yeah, there is. He's, he's getting real up in here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to pet him, but also, like, I need to continue talking about my boat sinking. He doesn't seem to mind. So, yeah, all the way up to the floor, there was just water. And I was like, wow, that's not good. So I took the manual pump that was on the boat, and I pumped it out into a bucket and just threw, like, 25 full buckets of water overboard. And then I immediately went to the dock master, who I'd kind of become friends with at this point, because I just kept going over and talking to him every day, because I was there. And I walked into his office and I said, my boat is sinking. <laughs> and he just looked at me and he was like, what do you mean it's sinking? And I was like, it, it's just sinking, like it's leaking, and the bilge pumps have died, and it's just gonna sink <laughs> if we leave it here. <laughs> and he was like, well, Jesus Christ, man, we gotta get that thing out of the water. Because like, you know, if it had sunk, then it was in a slip. Yeah. There's, they couldn't just leave it there. <laughs> right, right. I think it was like two days after. Yeah. It might have been a, the next day or the day after that. He got me a spot on the travel lift. Okay. So they could pull my boat out of the water. And that was another crap show, but I don't think we did it. We don't need to We're get gonna into get into all too many crap shows. Yeah. The moral of the story was, again, my limited boating experience was not enough. There was miscommunication with the marina, and I inevitably ended up falling back onto the couple basic skills I had learned from YouTube, which allowed me to get the boat over to where it needed to be with no damage and, and nothing crazy happened. So I guess the moral of the story there is that not everything I did was bad. If you're going to be operating a boat or really a vehicle of any kind, and just know how it works before you do it. So they pulled it out of the water and you went to London? Yep. When was this? This was November? Yeah. This was, I, I think believe, it was October because you wanted us to stay on the boat for that yeah. month. Yep. Right. But we were coming back. We were living in LA yeah. and we were road tripping back here to Massachusetts at the time and he wanted us to come live on the boat to kind of keep an eye on it. So imagine this, right? Andrew leaves for London and didn't know his boat was sinking yeah. and we come live on it and it's sinking. It's sinking. And then we have to deal with it. By the time you guys got there, the water would have been above the floor. Yeah. Thankfully, yeah, we would have <laughs> got there. And been like, um, Andrew, your boat is full of water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> your boat is already sunk. When you came back from London, is, did you go back to the boat to live on it? I didn't. I thought about it a lot, whether or not I should go back. I had already had the repairs done. They repaired the leak, so I was just going to go buy a new belt pump and rewire it. But I decided it was going to be winter soon, because by the time I got back, it was mid-November, I think. I went mm -hmm. from mid-October to mid-November. And so I just figured, hey, you know what, I'll go back to Massachusetts and I'll stay there until the winter's over. You know, it's already out of the water. There's no right. point to have to pay to put it back in the water just to live on it in the winter. Like, what were your thoughts on the on the whole living on a boat situation where you're like, maybe this wasn't right. Did you start to regret buying that boat or anything like that? No, not at all. Legitimately not at all. Even with all the crap that happened, like the time I spent on the boat, especially at the mooring, less so at the marina, because that was kind of, a, I didn't like that that much, but at the mooring, like the month I was there was just fantastic. I loved right. it. I didn't have running water. I didn't have electricity. I had to literally pee in a bucket because the only toilet on the boat was a port potty, which was basically just a fancy bucket. I had nothing, but at the same time, there was just like nothing like, like, I went to the grocery store and I picked up box wine, like gross box wine, poured myself a glass of it, and then just sat out on the bow of the boat at night and just like watched the sunset over New York City. You could see it right over there as it got darker. And it was just like the coolest thing That's ever cool. just yeah. to be out there. And like, there were limiting factors because of the boat, but I knew that if I wanted to go there, Mm -hmm. I could take my house there. I could be over there if I wanted to be. So there was just like nothing else like that. Yeah. So what was your plan after the winter then? During the winter, I started thinking about what I was going to do with the boat a lot more. I started to accept the fact that the boat had a lot of repair and maintenance that needed to be done on it that had been neglected over the years. So I decided to just keep it out of the water for a while and get it fixed. Just do the work myself. But my dad had mentioned that it's really hard to go to New Jersey. I knew this, of course, but he's like, yeah, what are you going to do when you go down there? The marina that I was staying at, this is something you should look into, by the way, if you're considering keeping a boat at a marina, because the marina I was staying at did not allow you to live on the boat while it was on land. Uh, so you had oh, to put I it back in the water that, yeah. to yeah. you know, live on it? In order to live on it, I had to put it back in the water, and I didn't want to put it in the water because I wanted to fix up the boat. 
What's up guys? I wanted to give you a quick update on our plan. In just over two weeks, we are road tripping down to Florida so that we can start buying our own boat. We're all super excited and it's pretty much just a waiting game. So make sure you subscribe to us so that you don't miss anything that happens. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in part three.